All right, going to do a study now on uh, what is a carnal Christian. Well, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Um, I use that one uh, pretty much exclusively because he will actually refer to scriptures uh, within his definitions. We'll see that here he has four different definitions for the word carnal. Uh, number one, it says pertaining to flesh, fleshly, sensual, opposed to spiritual as carnal pleasure. Okay. Number two, being in the natural state unregenerate, the carnal mind is enmity against God, Romans chapter 8. We're going to be looking at that here in a couple minutes. And again, very true. Number three, the third definition for carnal is pertaining to the ceremonial law as carnal ordinances, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10. And number four, lecherous, lustful, libidinous, uh, given to sensual indulgence, carnal knowledge, and sexual intercourse. Okay, that's what a lot of people would think of today. If you look up the modern word for carnal, you'll see that it is usually talking about sexual intercourse. Uh, fornication would be the right way to say it. So that's how the dictionary defines it. But is there another way to define it? What was that? I'll do a King James Bible word study on the word carnal. Hey, that's a good idea. Thank you for, for suggesting that. <laughs> We're going to look up the word carnal in our King James Bible. There's not that many references. And ironically, they're all in the New Testament. Interesting. Start out in Romans chapter 7. The first reference to the word carnal. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Hmm. Now, two things I want to make a mention of here. All right. Paul is this the first time that this word carnal appears in the King James Bible. Paul is writing it, the apostle to the Gentiles, our apostle, basically, here in the church age. But notice, he's speaking of being carnal, sold under sin, after being saved. You say, why is that important? Well, because there's people that say, when you preach repentance, that... And then you say that there's to be a changed life. Then they say, well, you're saying that you have to be sinlessly perfect from then on. Uh, no, I'm not teaching that. Why? Because Paul didn't teach it. Paul said, I'm carnal, sold under sin. When you get saved, yes, there will be a change. But the change is there in verse 15. What I hate, that do I. Your attitude towards sin changes. Why do you hate sin after getting saved? Because you realize it was those sins that you are committing that put Jesus on the cross. And he had to suffer for those sins that you're now struggling with. And you indulge in those sins, the Holy Spirit will convict you. See, that's the whole issue here. You will come to God as a sinner. You will come in a broken, contrite spirit. And when you get saved, there will be a change in your life. But you will still struggle with sin until the day of your death. But when you succumb to sin, when you are act carnal, when you're sold under sin there, when you give in to the lust of your flesh, you'll hate it. You won't justify it. You won't say, well, you know, hey, it's just, salvation is just belief. It's just a belief. There's no changed life. Give me a break. I can do what I want to do. I'm saved. I have faith that Jesus died for my sins. I have faith. I'm saved. Don't tell me I have to have a changed life. Oh, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to say, I hate these things that I'm struggling with. People that lust after pornography and end up and I'm going to just be straight here, end up masturbating to pornography. You know how you feel when you're done? Disgusting, dirty, vile. You hate the things that you did. People that struggle with alcohol. You wake up some morning and you realize you went too far, you got drunk. And you said and did a bunch of things that you should not have done as a Christian. You know what you'll feel? You'll feel hatred towards alcohol. Anyway, you can go on down the list. You will hate 
the things that you struggle with. It's evidence of a changed life. But let's go to the next one, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. We'll start there. It says here, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In other words, you can't make specific laws and rules to keep yourself from being carnal. You say, why? Well, prove that. Okay, look at any Catholic priest. They have all kinds of rules and things. Don't they take a vow of celibacy? Do they keep it? Are you kidding? Of course not. They're some of the worst uh, child molesters out there. Why? Because you can't make laws to keep your body from being indulging in sin. You can't do it. Verse 8, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So watch out when you have this charismatic movement where they say you get saved and then you have to seek the Spirit of God. You have to get the Holy Spirit after you get saved. Uh-uh. The Holy Spirit comes when you get saved. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're lost. This is the Spirit of Christ there. I'll say it that way. Verse 9. Verse 10 here in this passage. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You have help now. See, in the past, before, you couldn't overcome the, the sins of your flesh. All right? Uh, it's kind of like trying to, to, to dam up a leaky boat or something, or I should say seal up a leaky boat, and there's water coming in all these different holes, and you're trying to plug it with your fingers. Well, that doesn't work very long. But the Holy Spirit comes along, and He says, Hey, let me help you. There's still, still going to be some water coming in someplace, but we can get most of this stuff sealed up. Yeah, because you have help now. Before you're saved, you don't have the help of the Holy Spirit to overcome those sins. But when you're regenerated, when you're born again, now the Spirit of Christ comes in and you can fight the lusts of the flesh. But there's an interesting concept here with the thing of being carnal. All right? And this is how we define what a carnal Christian is. What is it? Verse 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. A carnal Christian is somebody that is living after the flesh. Somebody that's messing with the flesh. And you know what the interesting thing about this is? When you live after the flesh, your correction, your punishment, will be the very things that you're struggling with. So, huh? Alcohol. If you indulge your flesh too much in drinking of alcohol, you'll get drunk, which will lead to accidents. It'll lead eventually to cirrhosis of the liver. It can lead to all kinds of health problems, and especially because a lot of the alcohol out there is synthetic. It's not even natural. You know, you can take natural barley and you can ferment it and things and you get beer and whatever else. Wine, you can take grapes and, and organically raised grapes and, and you know, uh, let them ferment and things, squeeze the juice out of them, let that ferment and it becomes, you know, wine and things like this. A lot of that stuff now is being replaced with synthetic, which messes up all kinds of things with your health. You know, and I'm not, I'm not justifying, you know, drinking quote unquote natural alcohol. I avoid all of it, you know. But my point is, when you drink, uh, it can lead to the destruction of your flesh, your premature death. When you smoke cigarettes, you can get lung cancer, you can get emphysema, not to mention the fact that it's very expensive. Same thing with alcohol. Um, you go down through the list of sins, carnal sins will lead to your premature death. Yeah. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. All right. 
But it says there in verse 13, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, notice it says through the Spirit. You listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit when He says, hey, don't eat that, don't touch that, don't drink that, don't look at that. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Okay? You say, what does mortify the deeds of the body? What does that mean? Well, imagine, for, if you will, uh, I can relate to this because I have a little two-year-old son right now. And there's a constant thing of his little flesh wanting to touch things and wanting to grab things. And he's Thankfully, he's past the age of putting things in his mouth all the time now. But when you have a child or when you're around little children, they're constantly wanting to touch things. And you have to say, no, 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 don't touch that. Whoop, grab the thing away, don't touch that. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. You know, there's going to be times that you're going to be at the grocery store and you're going to go, oh, wow, look at that. A sale on Twinkies, huh? And the Holy Spirit says, don't touch that. Why? And he says, it's got corn syrup in it. High fructose corn syrup will trigger insulin reactions in your body. It's not a natural thing. It's, it's GMO based and things. Bad stuff. It's going to mess up your body. You're going to get diabetes. You can do the research on that. I'm telling you the truth. And the Holy Spirit says, don't touch that. It's high levels of sugar. It's going to give you a sugar high and then you're going to come crashing down. So you're going to be all energetic and hyper, and all of a sudden it's just going to be tired like this. The Lord says, that's not going to help you in your walk. How about getting that uh, fruit over there? Oh, okay. <laughs> but the Twinkies are more exciting. The Lord says, no. You go into the, you're driving down the road, and you see this nice restaurant there and everything, and you go, hey, I should probably go in there. And the Lord says, and all they got is fried food. Fried food, fast food, all this other junk, that's not going to help you in your walk. You know what you're doing? You're mortifying the deeds of your body. We're like little children. We want what we want, and we want it right now. And you reach out, and the Lord's like, don't do that. Well, I was just, listen to me. That's bad for you. Stop doing that. That's what's going on there. But a carnal Christian doesn't listen to the Holy Spirit. A carnal Christian reaches and grabs it. They'll reach and they'll grab that chocolate fudge brownie or something like that, and a little bit of that's fine. Don't, don't get ahead of me here. But they'll reach there and they'll grab that thing and they'll say, oh, that's really good, and wash it and stuff, and then they get it on their hands and they're putting it in their hair and it gets all over them. They enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, you see. They'll get into alcohol, they'll get into watching television, they'll get into whatever else, and next thing you know, it's all over them. And the Holy Spirit's up there just going, you need a bath. You need a bath badly. Uh, what's a bath? Uh, well, the Bible talks about being washed in the water of the Word, that we might be presented to the Lord as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, a chaste virgin. Sometimes we need a bath, brethren, and it comes from this book right here. You start to read this book and all of a sudden you get convicted and you go, oh boy, I'm doing that. That's wrong, isn't it? And the Lord says, yeah, get that out of your life. You know, it's one of the things I get people confused on, you know, with, with me. I shouldn't say I get con people confused. They get confused about what I'm saying. A lot of what my wife and I have put out over the years, it's not absolute, total dogmatic doctrine or something like this. It's suggestions. You know, if we say, hey, you shouldn't wear uh, polyester clothing or something like that, well, you're not going to go to hell if you wear polyester clothing. But, you know, it's going to not going to regulate your body temperature. It's a, it's a it, you know, petrochemical. It's oil-based. You know, so I say, you know, we say wear cotton or, or wool or silk or something. That's, that's all natural, you know, fibers. It's suggestions, all right? I mean, those are the things that are going to help you in life. Things about diet, things about your entertainment, going out for walks in the woods instead of watching a video in front of a television set. You know, that's what I'm talking about. But a carnal Christian, you see, they'll get into that stuff that messes up the flesh. They're like some stinky little child someplace that needs a bath really bad. And the Holy Spirit's the one to give the bath. 
Well, let's continue. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 26 and 27. Here's the next reference to carnal. Okay, it says here, verse 26, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. You say, wait a, carnal, you're, wait a second, we're supposed to minister unto other people in carnal things? Does that mean that the believers there in Macedonia went up to Jerusalem and said, hey, let's have a party? You know, we brought lots of sugar and lots of alcohol and, you know, whatever. No, 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 no. What's it talking about here? In context, it's talking about money. Money is called a carnal thing there. You can keep your hand in Romans chapter uh, 15 there, and we're going to go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Definitely the most hardcore passage on money in the entire New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we'll start at verse 6. It says here, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Now look at verse 9 and 10. These are very important key scriptures. For they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. It does not say those that are rich. Those that will be rich. They're coveting. They're wanting to be a millionaire or something like this. Verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You will err from the faith. You will become a uh, carnal Christian. If money becomes your goal, you'll start to do things. You'll start to, you know, kind of uh, embellish your ministry a little bit, you know. And, and uh, we're seeing lots of souls get saved, brethren. But unless we have your donations, we cannot continue this mighty work of God. We are looking to get $100,000 to build a new film studio. Because if we have just $100,000, then we'll be able to reach far more people. We'll be able to reach far more of the lost world. Uh-huh. Sure. you got to watch out for that stuff. I've seen that thing a, quite a few times, unfortunately, among some of the brethren. Money, 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 money. Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Hmm. Verse 10, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Almost sounds like they became carnal Christians, doesn't it? You can start out really good with the book, but you can get messed up because all of a sudden you can see, hey, wait a second, I can make good money with this thing. I wonder what would happen if I monetized my account here on Google. I could get even better money. I could get more subscribers, more subscribers, more money. More money, more subscribers. More subscribers, more money. <laughs> you know, sure, just like a dog running around trying to catch its own tail. Uh, you know, pierce yourselves through with many sorrows. Yeah, good idea. Get yourself to a point where you can't speak the truth anymore because it's going to cost you all that money that you've been making and you've gotten used to. You see what I'm saying? Well, let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is one that most people will think of. If you know your Bible, you'll think of this one about the thing of carnal, the way to define what is a carnal Christian. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 says here, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Is it a shame to be a baby Christian? No, no. It's not a shame to be a baby. It's a good thing to be a baby. Um, but you have to be extra careful. And you have to listen to your heavenly father more, you know. That's why the Bible talks about crying, Abba, Father, to him, you know, and, and 
calling out to him and saying, Lord, please, I don't know what to believe here. I don't this and that. You know, I'm not saying you don't need the Lord in your life when you get older as a Christian, when you become more spiritually mature. You always need the Lord. But the point is, when you're a baby Christian, you really, really, really got to stay close. You know? I mean, get in there and don't worry about being a baby Christian. Don't worry about asking dumb questions to people that are older in the faith and whatever. Ask them. Ask the Lord dumb questions. All right? Verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You know why there's so much strife and division on YouTube and on the internet world and in church buildings too, by the way, I might add? Because there's a lot of people that don't really should not be trying to feed people with meat. In fact, they don't need meat themselves. They need milk. Uh, there's a lot of novices out there that think that they know the book and they don't. Um, again, I'm not bragging here, but I spent quite a few years... Um, studying the Word of God, intensely studying the Word of God, uh, before I ever made my first video. I did not just say, I'm just going to come on YouTube and just start running my mouth because I think that I'd like to make a change in the world or something. Oh, no, no. Um, I realize it's a fearful thing for me to stand up and, and proclaim things from this book and not be sure about it. And when I'm wrong, and I've been proven wrong a number of times, I will come out and I will make a video and I will name names, I will say things and whatever else, whatever I got to do to acknowledge my error and correct it. All right. But if I'm not wrong, I'm not going to be correcting anything. But there's a lot of people out there that need milk and not meat. And by the way, again, it's not shameful to have milk. All right. Milk is very, very good for you. And uh, you can grow uh, very, very well on a diet of milk. But uh, verse 3, and I actually have a study if you want to look it up, um, milk versus meat, I think it's called. And I talk about, you know, you can keep drinking milk all the time, but you can't keep doing that with meat. If you just have a steady diet of just meat, how are you going to get it to, you know, how are you going to swallow the meat? You need milk to wash it down. So you get into some of the quote-unquote meat subjects of like the timing of the rapture. We'll just go back to the milk, the simple things that you learn from Scripture, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's milk, isn't it? That's a simple, basic little thing. Jesus loves me, a little children's song. Well, then why would Jesus send me through a time when God's wrath is going to be poured out on me? Doesn't make much sense, does it? Oh, well, this is strong meat, brethren. This is strong meat, this rapture stuff. Okay, I can wash it down with milk, can I? Well, you can if you believe in the uh, pre-trib rapture. But you can if you're a post-tribber. There's all kinds of doctrinal problems that you come up with. You have to leave the milk to swallow your brand of meat. Let's continue. Verse 4, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? I am a Lutheran, Martin Luther. I am a Wesleyan Methodist. I am a Mennonite, Menno Simons. I am a Calvinist. John Calvin. The Bible's so you know antiquated and out of date and things like that. You know it really doesn't apply to today. I don't think so. Continuing verse five, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Uh, any ministry that's doing anything, it's God that's working through it. And that's going to be true for me, and it's going to be true for you. If the Lord's not helping you, if the Holy Spirit isn't there to guide you, um, you're not going to do too good. You might uh, get carnal. Know what I mean? Next go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. It says here, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it, is, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Again, 
the love of money being the root of all evil doesn't mean that all money is bad. But it's interesting that now two different times the word carnal has been used to refer to money. And in context, it's a good thing. The first time it's talking about giving money to the poor saints at Jerusalem. The second time it's talking about giving money to ministers of the gospel. But both, both times Paul is very careful to say it's your carnal things. What is more carnal than money? I mean, money is just like, you know, I mean, there's an old saying, they, they say, uh, you know what God thinks of money by the kind of people that he gives it to. A lot of truth in that. <laughs> but uh, very interesting. But let's go to the next one, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. A lot I could be saying on these things here, these points, but trying to get through this. That's the amazing thing about God's book. It's just so filled with truth. Here's another interesting reference to carnal. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself above, excuse me, against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's an interesting verse. Very interesting verse. You know, right now in the news, there's this big thing, this big, oh, scary thing. Today's September the 11th, by the way. Uh, 2016, and just a couple days ago, North Korea tested a nuclear weapon, and they felt the shocks from it in Japan. And everybody's going, oh, North Korea, ah, oh, they got a nuclear weapon, you know. Well, so does the United States, and so does Russia, you know. And the United States is the only one that's ever used atomic weapons in a warfare setting, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians. But you can trust us with the weapons, don't worry. Yeah. But isn't it interesting that people make such a huge deal about nuclear warheads and intercont intercontinental ballistic missiles and, and all these weapons and things. And the nations are like, oh, we feel safe having our weapons. Or, oh, we don't feel safe now because they have weapons too and all this stuff. And yet uh, this weapon right here is far more powerful than all of them combined mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Do you realize the weapon that you have in your hands, Christian? Do you realize the treasure that this book is? You say, oh, you're, you're worshiping that book, you're exalting that book. Uh, brethren, I don't exalt this book enough. All right? And I don't worship the book, I worship the Lord. But I'll tell you what, this is His book. This is a mighty spiritual weapon. This book here can change the course of nations. Why do you think uh, Satan wants to get rid of this book? Why do you think so many people try to talk about their experiences and say, well, the Bible's a good book, but take you away from the book? You know why? Because it's a mighty weapon. And it can pull down strongholds. I mean, where do you think this uh, leader of North Korea, where do you think he's keeping his nuclear warheads? Out in the backyard of some shopping mall over there in North Korea? No. I'm sure he's got that thing in a fortified bunker, some kind of underground thing or whatever else. Lord only knows. Well, uh, this book here can pull down those strongholds. Oh, and by the way, it will. You say, that, that book there? Oh yes, this book here. Because you see, this book says what's going to happen in the future. And eventually the world leaders are hiding themselves in the dens and the rocks and caves, praying that the rocks fall on them to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. Uh-huh. And we see when we come back down with Jesus Christ, we're going to be going out and getting those people in their little underground bases, their little strongholds. It's talking spiritually, I realize, there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But uh, physically, even, uh, this book, 
is going to be how they're judged. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge them in the last day, Jesus said. Hmm, interesting. You say, well, what's the carnal thing? I don't understand how the carnal comes into the whole thing. Well, you can see uh, right now, well, we're in America. We're never going to be attacked. Why? we got the strongest military in the world. What is it? It's carnal. It's carnality. You know what you're better off doing? The Lord's going to protect me no matter what happens. Why? Because I have a strong weapon. I have the greatest weapon in the universe right here in my hands. The God of the universe wrote a book and told me what's going to happen in the future, what happened in the past, what's happening in the present, and he gives it to me in a book. Does the King James Bible have a prominent place in your life? I hope so. Or are you uh, relying on your carnal weapons? We'll fight. We're going to defeat the New World Order because we're going to get Donald Trump in the office and he's going to restore America. He's going to make America great again. Really? Oh, really? Uh, no, thank you. I'll rely on my book, the same book that uh, has been there to bring peace and, you know, uh, uh, nice, you know, blessings from God, great blessings from God. In the last 400 years, the Christians have used this book. Uh, I'm going to get mine here. Thank you. I don't want to be carnal. I don't want to go off and look at the things of this world and try to get my protection from those things. Let's continue. Hebrews, or, yeah, Hebrews chapter 7. I was looking at the thing there. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 15 and 16. Another reference here to the word carnal. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 15. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Okay? You say, well, who is this in reference to? The Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He is our high priest right now. He is not some Jewish rabbi that works at a Torah institute that's telling you, well, the Talmud says this, and our sages have just said this, and I, we just had a guy over in Jerusalem just had a, had a vision, and he's going to, um, he saw these things. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ, my high priest, your high priest, if you're saved, and eventually the Jewish people, when they understand that it was Jesus, um, he'll be their Messiah as well uh, when the blinders are lifted off. Other studies on that, but when that happens, they're going to realize Jesus is the high priest and he is not, like it says there um, in verse 16, not after the law of a carnal commandment. You know, you look back through the old, or, well, Old Testament doctrine, you look at some of the gospel accounts of when Jesus is dealing with these Pharisees and things, they're having their carnal commandments that have no basis in Scripture. They're just things that they've created, and they're trying to bring Jesus into subjection under those carnal commandments. So you see, again, we go back to the thing of people saying, uh, well, I might not live by the King James Bible, but I'm just going to kind of, I believe this commandment and that commandment, it's all man-made stuff. A good example would be Roman Catholics. They have all kinds of rules and things like that that appear nowhere in Scripture. And they'll try to say that you and I are heretics because we don't follow their carnal commandments. Well, Jesus Christ doesn't either. So who's carnal? Finally, let's look at the last one here. Hebrews chapter 9, last reference to the word carnal. We're going to see something similar here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, 
which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. And then you read verse 11 down through 17. That's the time of reformation. When Jesus Christ dies on the cross, the death of the testator, the New Testament begins. Right? The New Testament, as I've said many times, does not begin in Matthew chapter 1. Right? It's a collection of books called the New Testament, but the actual New Testament begins with the death of Jesus Christ. So what you're reading there in Matthew 26, back through to chapter 1, those things are doctrinally in the Old Testament. And it's being written. I mean, you can see some shades of the church age coming in the, you know, where God's dealing with both Jews and Gentiles. It's there a little bit. You can see it kind of foreshadowed. But he's dealing mostly with the nation of Israel. Again, other studies on that. But that's the last time that the word carnal appears in your King James Bible. Let me show you something interesting about this, this thing of carnal ordinances, carnal laws, and things like that, carnal commandments. Go back to Matthew chapter 23. We're going to see about this thing of these carnal laws of the Old Testament Jews. Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greeting in the markets, greetings in the markets, and to be called of men Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You say, oh, I don't understand where the carnal part come in. Uh, well, organized religion is actually, if you want to look at the most carnal people on the earth, the people who are in organized religion are the most carnal sinners out there. Why? All their works are doing to be seen of men. Do you think, I mean, if the Pope was such a great guy and everything else, you know, if he was truly humble, if he followed verses 11 and 12 there, he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. I know they get a little ceremony where he goes and he washes feet of select people and stuff. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But can you imagine the Pope simply saying, you know what, I'm not going to live at St. Peter's Basilica. You know, we need to sell this thing, give the money to the poor and all this gold, what, what, what's all this expense? Private airplane? Nah, I don't think so. You know, just driving me around this car and stuff like this, and I'm standing there going like this, waving at people. You know, no, 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 no. We don't need to do any of that stuff. Of course he's not going to do that. Why? Because he's carnal. He's lost, but, you know, we're talking about carnal Christians in this study. But the point is, you can, as a Christian, you can fall into some of that same stuff. You can let the standards and things that you have as a Christian, you can let those go to your head and where you start to think, hey, I'm somehow better than these other people out there. And you start to forget that you're a sinner too. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden you're saying, I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. I'm not like uh, whatever. And you don't even realize it, but you've got major carnal issues yourself. So, what have we learned so far? What is a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian is somebody that's giving into their flesh. Be it loss of the flesh, the, the, as far as overeating, um, things that are going to be bad for your health, things like that. There's that. Um, but then also giving into the uh, lust of money, covetousness and things like that and creating carnal commandments and things to try and make yourself better, putting your faith in things other than the Lord and His Word. See, those are carnal things that, that uh, you'll get into. Um, but I want you to notice that all carnal sins, all those things, are actually self-correcting. In other words, they're, they'll punish you by you doing them. All right. uh, when Paul was saying the things that he's doing, he hates... Uh, it's because there were consequences for his actions. Uh, again, 
take something as simple as eating a high fructose corn syrup. Uh, I mean, it's tough, brethren. It's in everything. I mean, MSG is in all kinds of stuff. You know, I mean, we were eating ice cream, and it's like natural ice cream and stuff like this, you know, and don't eat it very much because it's, you know, fairly expensive, but everything else got corn syrup in it. We look at this ice cream, and it's like, oh, praise the Lord, doesn't have corn syrup in it. Uh, Briar's natural ice cream, vanilla and stuff. And uh, looked at it, and it's like, we're looking at the ingredients. My wife goes, oh, brother. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's got natural flavors in it. Natural flavors is another name for MSG. Uh, you know, you're just like, okay, cross another one off the list. Can't eat that either. <laughs> you know? And you say, you can't, you're going to go to hell if you don't. No, no, no. You know, it's not about going to heaven or hell. It's just about when you eat the stuff, you'll feel weird afterwards. And admittedly, I did. You know? See? But if you just don't care, if you give up on all that stuff, and you just say, I'll do whatever I feel like doing. I'm just going to live however I want to live. Well, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. You're going to have health problems. You're going to have other issues and things like that. You're not going to be as effective as you could be for the Lord. But here's an interesting thing. Because you're going to say, well, uh, what about doctrine? All right, because this stuff is all, carnal stuff is fleshly. So you see a Christian... Um, and they're right doctrinally, but they're having some struggles with their flesh. Uh, I know of Christian brethren that are King James Bible-believing, and yet they're overweight. King James Bible-believing, and yet they have other issues and things like that. They're in debt because they're coveting things that they can't afford. Um, and we're talking way in debt or something, you know. I mean, because they're, they're driving new vehicles and living in big houses and all this other stuff. They're trying to live a lifestyle that they probably shouldn't be living in the first place. Okay, that's carnality. All right, that's important to understand. But here's the true test. You say, because what's the difference between a carnal Christian and somebody who's a false convert? Well, where you're going to see the difference is there, the carnal Christian is going to have problems with their flesh. They're going to have some of these issues that carnal things that we went over here in the scriptures but they're going to be right doctrinally. You say, but can't we agree to disagree on certain things? Yeah, but let's look at what those are. There are certain areas where we can agree to disagree on certain things. But I'm going to show you that a lot of things that we teach and believe in the Bible, um, there's no leeway there. There's no loophole saying, well, I don't have to believe that. Romans chapter 14. Turn there in your King James Bible. Um, and this is, this is where it's important because there's so many false uh, professing Christians out there and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll try to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm saved, uh, you know, or they'll say, I think so-and-so is saved, they're just a carnal Christian. Uh, well, you know, be careful judging somebody according to the flesh if they're messing around with things and whatever else. Look at the doctrinal statements, okay? Look at their doctrinal stands, I should say, uh, that, they, that they take um, that's where I'll judge people, first and foremost. But if I see some of the things in this list that I'm going to give you here, that they take certain stands that I disagree with, well, I say, okay, we have some liberty there. There's some leeway. Um, I don't have to agree with them in those areas to prove one way or the other if they're saved. We'll look at this here. Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Doctrine, in other words. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Diet. We can disagree on diet. I know some brethren that are vegetarian. They choose not to eat meat. It's not that they command to abstain from meats. Uh, as it warns about over in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, I believe it is. It's not that they're commanding to abstain from meats. They just say, hey, I don't want to eat meat. I eat herbs, so to speak. Fine. Look at this, verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. We can agree to disagree on diet. Verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now here's another one coming up. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded, 
in his own mind. If you haven't run into it yet, you will into, run into Christians that are against holidays. Right? They'll say Christmas is of the devil, Easter's of the devil, any holidays of the devil. I've even met brethren that try to say birthdays are of the devil. Okay, um, that's fine. If they want to take stands against Christmas and things and whatever else, and you know, I'm against Santa Claus and some of the you know stuff like that. But I mean, good night. If you buy a gift and you say, here, I want to give this to you, and and it's a, it's a nice time to to take the children out, see lights and things, Christmas lights and whatever. I realize that there are some cultures that are not as as into the Christmas thing. Whatever. The verse says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You know, the New Testament is written to Gentiles. So you might have an African that has a certain holiday that's not bad and whatever else, and they want to do that. Well, I'm German descent. I don't really care about African holidays or Spanish holidays or Oriental holidays or things like that. All right? We can agree to disagree on the issue of holidays, celebrating holidays. Verse 6, He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we, there, or whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself, you, in other words, to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Again, some people will say, the Christmas tree is a wicked thing, it's Baal worship and whatever else. Uh, is that what it is to you? Well, it's a, that, it has to be that way. No, no, no. There's nothing unclean in of itself. It's a spruce tree or a pine tree. It's not unclean. God made it. Oh, but, you know, all these, all these arguments and things. Yeah, there's arguments both ways, right? Somebody says, brother, I'm not going to, I mean, I have a brother here in the local area and things, and we talked the one time, and he said, I don't agree with you on your stands for Christmas. I said, well, I don't agree with you on your stands against Christmas. And we're still in fellowship. We can still say, hey, fine, whatever. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. No big deal. He's not a heretic. He's a good man. I'm not a heretic. You see, we can agree to disagree on this issue. Now, if he shows up and he says, hey, you know what? I don't think that you're right condemning the Catholic Church. He wouldn't say that because he's a former Catholic. He's saved now, but, but you understand my point. Uh, well, we can't agree to disagree on that issue. You see, there are certain things we must be in agreement on. But let's continue here. Verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Hey, you know, if I ever get around a Jew that's saved, I'm not going to pull out a bunch of pork products and start eating pork products. Why? Well, to them, that they're raised that way. It's like, oh, pork, no, it's unclean stuff. I, no, I'm not going to mess with it. Whatever. See? To me... I'll eat pork. I'm German descent. Okay, uh, we eat a lot of pork. <laughs> you know, German type people. Fine, no big deal. But if I'm around somebody that that's offensive to, well, okay, put the bacon away and whatever else. Get out some beef. You see how that works? Verse 17: For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth, serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor drink, 
nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. I don't mess with wine. I know some brethren that have openly come out and said, I like to drink some wine now and then. I'm not about to do that. Why? Because I know that there are Christians out there that struggle with drunkenness, that are recovering alcoholics. Now, if I'm coming out and I'm saying, yeah, I just had some wine the other night. We went out and, you know, I went to the liquor store and I bought some wine and things. See, it's a problem. I mean, I got bumper stickers all over my vehicles and stuff, you know, witnessing type things. Is it going to look good if I drive to a alcohol store someplace, liquor store, and come walking out carrying things of alcohol? No. Verse 22. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, damned in the context there is not talking about you lose your salvation. Okay? That isn't going to happen. What it means is you can be damned in the sense of your life becomes essentially a living hell on this earth. Why? Because you're living as a hypocrite, essentially. You see? That's what's going on there. So, let's continue. So we can see diet and celebrating holidays there are two things that we can agree to disagree on. You might have a Christian that's a vegetarian. You might have a Christian that's eats meat and whatever else they want to eat. Um, you might have a Christian that's uh, celebrating Christmas. You might have a Christian that says, I don't want to celebrate Christmas. Fine, we can agree to disagree on those things. Let's look at a couple other things here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 6. It says here, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. This is something that we can agree to disagree on, okay? It's something that every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. In other words, is what Paul's saying here. Verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Paul is writing as a single man, Okay? But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. All right? If you don't have an issue with lust or anything else, Paul is saying, my advice is stay single. But if you occasionally have some lust issues and you're burning and things like that, or if you just have a desire, I'd really like to have somebody in my life, a husband or a wife, depending on what you are, um, they get married. Well, the, you know, we must reject anybody who's not married as a Christian. No, 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 no. We can agree to disagree on these issues. You get somebody who's single, there's many ways that they can serve the Lord better than I can as a married man. Uh, I was a single man for 36 years. I understand that, you know, concept. But then again, there's things that I can do now as a married man, uh, having a wife that helps me with, me with my research, me with the ministry. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to being married. And even having, you know, a son now too. There's a lot of great things that can come in and, and your perspectives and views change and things like that. So then I should condemn people that are single, right? No. If you want to stay single, you say, I don't want it, your kind of life, brother. Okay, fine. You don't have to marry. You don't have to have children. Whatever. You know, now that I'm married, I wouldn't want to go back to being single. I'm very happy with what the Lord has done, you know, in my life, giving me a wife and things like that. But you see, if I see somebody who's single and they want to be single, I'm not going to come down on them for wanting to be single. That's what's going on there. Another area where we can agree to disagree as Christians. Next go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. It says here, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. If, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. What about hair length? Well, I believe that there's a reason God made men and women differently. I believe that men should have manly style hair, short hair in other words, uh, and I believe women should have long hair. But what happens when a woman has short hair and a man has long hair? Well, there's some shame there. 
You say, well, then they're, they're not really saved there because they're, they're wicked or something. No, I don't agree with that. I think that somebody could be saved and a woman could be saved and have short hair and a man could be saved and have long hair, uh, but it's a shame. You see? But notice what Paul says there in verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, arguing over these things, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. There's no, well, it has to be an inch above the collar of your, of your collared t-shirt or something like this, and you can't have facial hair because that's a, you know, bad. There's no such custom. All right? Again, no such custom. What does that mean? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I mean, I don't want to be ashamed before God. My wife doesn't want to, you know, have God be ashamed of her. She wants to have glorious long hair, you know. So it's always funny to me, you know, you get these Mennonites and things like this and Amish, and they, they take their long, beautiful hair that God gave them that's there for a glory to them, and they take it and they roll it all up and they put it they put pins in and stuff like this, and then they put a covering, then they put a covering on top. And it's like, <laughs> kind of missing the point there a little bit, you know. <laughs> your hair is given for a covering, all right? Not your hair needs to have a covering on top. But finally, let's end here, Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Show you another area where we can agree to disagree. And there could be a few others. I was trying to think of some of the stuff where we can agree to disagree, so to speak. Some things that we can agree on, some things we can disagree on. That uh, if somebody is eating meat, that doesn't mean that they're carnal. If somebody is, you know, celebrating Christmas, doesn't mean that they're carnal. We're agreeing to disagree on these areas. That the scripture tells us we can do that in. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And I thought that's a good verse to end this study on. Um, what liberty we have as Christians, these areas that we can agree to disagree on, um, don't use those liberties that God has given us for an occasion to the flesh. Um, you know, if I, uh, if Christmas became a thing for us, I mean, we call it Weihnachten because it's that's the German thing, which doesn't even mean Christmas. It's basically like a, a holy night or something, essentially, is what that is, um, the translation of it. And there's a lot of other cultures, by the way, which use names for Christmas that, when translated, they don't mean Christmas. Because that's one of the big arguments, you know, Christ Mass and all stuff. But if Christmas all of a sudden became a thing where it was becoming very carnal, making us very carnal, and we were eating a lot of sugar-laden cookies and we're, we're going way into debt to buy all kinds of gifts for all kinds of people and we're going and getting into the Santa Claus thing and telling our son, you better be good because Santa Claus is watching and all this stuff. Uh, yeah, it's going too far. You see, it's becoming carnal. Um, if we were just wrecking our health because of eating meat all the time and never eating any vegetables um, and starting to get very carnal, getting very overweight uh, because of sacrificing our health, uh, yeah, it's a sin. You see, God's given us liberty in certain areas where we can agree to disagree, but the liberty should never become an occasion to the flesh. You know, see, that's the whole issue here. So, to sum things up, I will say this. It's a very good question that the sister asked. She said, what's the difference between a false convert and a carnal Christian? Well, a false convert is going to be off doctrinally. And they'll probably be off, you know, in these areas of carnality that we talked about. Um, but a saved, born-again, Bible-believing Christian uh, that's carnal is going to be off in a few areas uh, and it's not the areas that we talked about of holidays and eating and hair length and things that and single versus married and whatever those areas you have liberty in see that's not the debate here but the Bible does not give any grounds for 
we can agree to disagree on the timing of the rapture. Uh, well, when you study it out, I'll, I mean, I'll take it easy on new Christians that don't really, they have been deceived by these post-trib liars. I'll take it easy on them. But when you see people that know the issue and continue to attack the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble, nope, sorry, they're not saved. I don't believe that for one minute. Um, why? It's basic Bible doctrine. You know, we're not appointed to God's wrath. We are not appointed to going through a time where God's pouring out judgment and wrath upon the world. I mean, and I've done so many studies on it, it's that you, you have no excuse if you're a postie. Um, dispensationalism. Uh, that's not debatable. When the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Those are commands. It's not saying... You know, I speak this by permission, not of commandment. No, 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 no. You're not going to see anything there. You know, let every man be fully persuaded in his own man. Mind, excuse me. You're not going to see that. Bible doctrine. A carnal Christian will be dispensational. A carnal Christian will believe that the rapture is going to happen before the time of Jacob's trouble. A carnal Christian will believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word. But... They'll have problems with their health. They'll have problems sometimes with their marriage. They'll have financial problems. They'll have other issues like that. That's a carnal Christian. But when you see these modern professing charismaniac people and stuff, and they're just so far out, and they're, they're just blasphemous, wicked doctrines, you're not dealing with carnal Christians, brethren. You are dealing with lost people. That's what you're dealing with. Okay? So watch out for some of this stuff, these false prophets coming along, these false uh, people giving a false gospel, and they'll come out and they'll say, you know, well, uh, people that are sodomites and things, you know, they're, you know, they're in sodomy, they're, they're doing all this stuff, but they're just carnal Christians. The modern church people, they're carnal Christians. They're not carnal Christians. There is no leeway in Scripture. There are no looped holes in Scripture saying, we can disagree on major points of doctrine and still be in fellowship. We can agree to disagree on major points of doctrine. No, we can't. No, we can't. You know, they, they, like I've said in many studies, people come out and they say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a fundamentalist. Uh, the fundamentals are just basic Bible doctrine, just understanding of Scripture. You know, the, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the blood atonement. Those are the fundamentals. And there's a couple more, you know, but the, the point is they're basic principles of scripture you can't be a christian and deny the fundamentals of the faith can't happen if you're a christian and you say i don't want anything to do with christmas i think single living is best i think eating um you know vegetarian diet is good okay i'm not going to judge you on that stuff we have liberty to do to agree to disagree on those things but when you start coming out and you start telling all these uh false doctrines and things like this you're not carnal. You're lost. All right? So that is going to be it for this study. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, definitely have some other good questions here coming up, uh, different sermons and ideas and things like that. But uh, uh, just got done recording the other sermon here. It's getting pretty late. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to close this thing out. And we will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.